Welcome back to Africa Science Focus, the weekly science and development show from SciDevNet. I'm Ogechi Kianyao. On this week's episode of our Science Explained series, we try to understand the concept of mini-grids, a potential solution to Nigeria's long-standing electricity challenges. But first, what is a mini-grid? The United Nations Industrial Development Organization defines a mini-grid as a set of small-scale electricity generators interconnected to a distribution network that supplies electricity to a small, localized group of customers. It usually operates independently from the national transmission grid. The benefits of mini-grids go beyond simply providing electricity. They offer a more affordable and sustainable option compared to diesel generators, a common but expensive and polluting solution in off-grid communities. But how accessible are mini-grids, especially in Nigeria, where according to a World Bank report in February 2024, over 85 million people, more than 4 out of 10 Nigerians, are deprived of electricity? In this episode, Africa Science Focus editors Ogichi Kianya and Titilope Fadari spoke to researchers Timila De Chesson and Ewa Ileri, who explored the connection between mini-grid market regulation and energy access expansion in Nigeria. Ewa Ileri is the executive director of Nigerian-based think tank International Center for Energy, Environment and Development. He lets us know how mini-grids operate. Mini-grids are situated between what used to be conventional means of extending electricity, which is uh, grid-connected uh, electricity, the ones that we all know very well that uh, comes from the... Um, the, the central uh, um, electricity grid system to our homes. Between that and the off-grid, which is the isolated, uh, for instance, what has become very popular in Nigeria, um, solar home systems and, and so on. So they are meant to sit in between where uh, governments or communities uh, provide electricity supply for for a particular community, which means that you set up um, generation either using renewable energy like solar or as we did in Nigeria many years ago, uh, using diesel generators for isolated um, fire off communities and therefore set up a grid system whereby we connected households <clears throat> and uh, and production units. But now going over to Dr. Timila De Chesa, who researches energy for sustainable development, to understand how serious the power supply problem is in Nigeria. That's that's the issue. So Nigeria already has like the, um, as you say in our paper, the least reliable um, electricity supply on the continent. So as I said earlier, that we um, did a study across four countries, even. Um, among those four countries, Nigeria has the most abysmal performance, um, not just in terms of the absolute quantities, but relative to the population. Remember that Nigeria is what we call the giant of Africa. So we have, um, for example, by comparison, Kenya, um, maybe maximum there are like about a quarter of our population, but even in terms of, you know, even at that, they have um, about 70, over 70% 70 coverage, electricity coverage, um, close to 80. Um, whereas here, with over 200 million people, we, we only have um, about 60% coverage and it's far less in the rural areas that are being targeted. So we need to look at the context and say this is a huge, huge gap. Um, what role, if we're looking at universal access by 2030, what role can uh, many ways, and then we'll also go on to ask um, provocatively in, you know, the policy implications section to say that um, what role can many grids play in concert, right, with other options? If the goal is universal electrification, if the goal is to leave no one behind, how can we be more creative in ensuring that we reach this goal um, by all the means available to us? To achieve universal energy access, Nigeria needs a more nuanced approach to electricity sector reform, acknowledging its geographical, political, and social context. Ileri explains why the power supply in Nigeria remains so problematic over the years. The problems associated with expanding electricity access is 
not um, it's not unconnected with the lack of progress that we have made in expanding available um, available grid electricity over the years. Uh, the government in Nigeria, since uh, the year 1999 to 2000, and singled out the electricity sector as a major area of investment, as a as an a pivotal infrastructure area, and and unfortunately, uh, the available power we are generating and transmitting and the capacity to distribute them have not grown according to the scale or the ambition of the government to say the least over the years. And therefore, uh, when the available electricity has not grown significantly, we also expect that it will affect other means of, of delivering electricity services. Um, uh, so, so, so that the, the challenge is not unconnected with the development in the broader electricity system. Um, for, for many grids, um, my take on why it has uh, been a bit difficult to make progress here, but on the broader context, uh, many grids came at a time um, where there is an ideological change, an ideological shift in how we deliver electricity. In the 80s, 40 years ago, uh, government has assumed an important role of planning the delivery of electricity services to, the, to, to all parts of Nigeria, including rural areas. And, and, and therefore, there was significant investment, significant budget lines in, in all the budgets at both at the federal and state level in ex expanding electricity. Now, now comes uh, the uh, past uh, few decades where there is reforms in the electricity sector. And it wasn't only in Nigeria. This is something that the World Bank uh, and, and the Washington consensus uh, uh, agreed on that uh, these reforms have to happen in most countries. And unfortunately, part of the collateral damage of that reform is that government lost interest or government's role became very reduced in financing electricity assets expansion. And what we had left are private sector solutions or hybrid forms of that. So, so the lifeblood of, of expanding assets is actually financing. And when you withdraw a key role player in financing electricity assets expansion, uh, then you can begin to find the root causes of the challenges we face. So now what we have are trickles of funding that comes from international development assistance, going primarily to off-grid and mini-grids. And, and, and I think there, that shift in paradigm between uh, public-led uh, or state-led solutions to private sector-led solutions, it is, and that it is in that Nexus that we can find most of the challenges that we have in delivering electricity in general to to unserved communities. As Nigeria targets universal energy access by 2030, mini grids can help bridge the energy access gap. However, the deployment of mini grids pose significant governance, regulatory, and socio-economic challenges. Dr. Chesson provides insight into how Nigeria can adopt mini grids to help it meet its target to achieve universal access by 2030. The situation we find ourselves now, in now, is um, linked 
um, totally to the failures of what we call the NESI, the Nigerian electricity supply industry. Um, the pseudo privatization that left discos, um, yeah, almost insolvent um, and with very low institutional financial technical capacity to um, deliver discos by the um, the founding EP, EPS area, that's the Electric Power Sector Reform Act of 2005, were supposed to be the de facto last mile um, distributors. Um, to everywhere, like including potentially rural areas. But discos um, don't have the capacity now, um, several, almost like a, a, yeah, two decades later. And so it is these gaps that are that are showing. And rather than um, address or approach these issues holistically, it seems like many grades, um, again, whether intentionally or not, have... Um, now being you know they're now being seen like as a quick fix to issues that are more fundamental to the sector um yes some funding came in uh, from you know development finance institutions that are um keen uh, on the decarbonization agenda no problem with that but how does it fit into our own like broader national priorities and strategies um the financing that we have again that Ewa touched on um from from this dfis um, is actually debt, you know, it's not, they're not grants. Um, they're given out as grants to private sector developers, but it's debt. It's debt that um, your children and my children are expected to pay back, um, you know, in the future. And so they, you know, it makes it all the more imperative that this investment actually delivers the, the intended, um, intended um, output. But nobody is really looking at that in a very holistic manner. And back to your point, your core point about equity, um, which we try to, uh, yes, it is uh, it's the core of the paper to say that, again, these interventions, these mitigating interventions, they have delivered something, okay? That's not to say they have done nothing. However, I think um, our research shows that the key thing is we need to be questioning whether, and there are, there's some evidence pointing to this, that this whole sort of market regulatory arrangement has the tendency, it looks like it might be reproducing inequalities, right? Existing inequalities. So, um, for example, just as a, so sort of we try to break it down, um, to the extent that these things have worked for people in rural areas, it tends to um, displace, right, um, supply for power supply that was previously provided by diesel and petrol, right? So, Businesses, for example, um, um, small and medium enterprises, say cold rooms or guest houses or something in rural areas that used to use diesel um, are now the ones benefiting the most from um, mini grids. So the tariffs, even though they're high in in absolute terms, relative to how much they were spending in on diesel and petrol is, is um, lower. And that's not a bad thing, right? But, you know, uh, maybe the more, in many ways, the more urgent need would be to spur new demand, you know, um, by increasing productivity in the rural areas. That's the whole point of this drive. Um, you don't have people who couldn't afford electricity before or alternatives. You don't have them now um, being moved en masse to mini grids. So it's like re reproducing the existing um, divide between who has power, who had power. Yes, from fossil fuels and from, you know, um, um, from temporary sources, um, generators, but people who had power before um, and people before and after, there's almost no difference uh, between those who have access to the power. And that's the key thing. It's it's a it's the reality that we now have to face. How do we then um, bring in and this is and this is the I. This is the inclusiveness in the sigma um, sort of um, objectives. How do we bring in? people who have been excluded historically, um, such that we leave no one behind, as the SDGs say. Um, it's an affordable, there's a big affordability issue with the mini grids that uh, we have now. And it's interesting because in institutionally, it's like no one wants to touch the poor, right? So you have from our research, you have the discos saying, essentially they won't go, um, you know, they won't go near rural areas uh, with a poll because they can't pay. Um, the government is, you know, essentially offloading that responsibility that Ewa was talking about of 
making public finance available for rural education, essentially ceding it to the private sector and to DFIs. Um, the private sector um, actors, uh, you know, if there are any any heroes in this story, would be them because they are trying to basically make things work where you know it's it's really um, difficult. Um, but but they have they don't have as much capacity as you know they are not as capitalized, for example, as um, um, even discos that have all these problems. So um, currently. The system is is not to the benefit of the poorest who would really um you know who really need um electricity to be extended to them. Ileri shares insights on decentralized grid systems within the context of the limited mini grid connections in Nigeria. It is our national goal to reach universal access. And we keep as a country, we keep setting national targets. So actually today, in many documents, our target is to you to reach universal access to electricity services by 2030. And, and so, so, so governments assign roles for grid uh, connected electricity, meaning grids and uh, stand alone systems or off grid. Um, energy services. So, so mini grids would be significant, or its contribution would be significant if it provides a a sizable share of or of those connections of 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 providing access to uh, the population. Now we have. Uh, recent estimates, we have nearly 100 million Nigerians who are not connected to electricity services. And that's over 30 million households, for instance, who are not connected to electricity services. Um, and, and just from that deduction, uh, because of the size of the number of households that are not connected and the growth in the number of households that we have every year as a result of population increases, we should be doing at least 1 million new connections to electricity every year to be able to just uh, close the gap that, that we have uh, until the year 2030. So if we are doing well at all, uh, we should, as a country, be delivering uh, access up to at least 1 million new households every year. So where does mini grid stand here? Uh, and I think that is where we need to situate the question. How many households do we currently connect using mini grids? Uh, and how do we compare it to uh, standalone systems and grid-connected electricity? So that is the crux of the matter. And our study clearly states that the, that the scope of that challenge that mini grids meet is almost insignificant. You know, if you put together all the installed mini grids in our country, that the total amount the the total number of connections that presently exists uh, it's so low compared to 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 the that scope of the challenge of of closing that gap so so in that way and that is really one of the essence of our study to see how many grids can be more effective uh how uh it could play a a, a bigger role in, in providing electricity access. So what can be done to get mini grids to play a bigger role in electricity access? And how can the government and the private sector increase electricity access in rural areas? I really think that we need to we need to rethink uh, so called the so called political economy of how we expand uh, electricity services. Uh, because come to think of it, most of us who live in urban areas, we we rent 
an apartment or buy a home in areas where there is already cables of electricity connecting our households. So what we do is that when we move into a new place, we pay monthly uh, charges as we consume electricity. Uh, the inequality that Temilade talks about there is that if you don't live in those areas and you are poor, you are asked to pay the capital costs of generating, transmitting, and distributing electricity all in one. And that is essentially where the inequality lies in the private sector solutions to electricity houses. You know? And if we take a step back, in most of the countries that have successfully expanded electricity services to remote areas, both in developed and developing countries. They have been done by public sector investments. There are very few exceptions to this rule. There are very few countries that you can point to in the literature where the universal access has been reached by private sector investments. Um, in the main. So, so, so we need to resituate this uh, discussion about electricity being important for the overall development of, of, of the rural areas and, 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 and areas that are not being reached. To see how government and the private sector can work more effectively uh, to, to, to expand access because um, we, have, we have seen over the past few decades that progress has been very slow using this new paradigm of exclusively private sector investments. So I think we need to, it, it, uh, the electricity sector should not just be seen as a technical or uh, an investment area. We should also be seen as 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 a governance area. You know that uh, the way we see the delivery of roads. You know that essentially you don't te tell a community to pay the total cost of building a roads before they can use it. It is when the road is built that you can now set up toll gates or taxes. To pay for to pay back the cost of the roads. So what we are asking the poor to do is is essentially to build a road themselves before they can use it, and that is where the the inequality lies in that. So I think there's uh, that we we should look at the politics, not only the policies but the politics behind the delivery of energy services, and and this. Uh, is uh, you can see that clearly in, in the results that you're getting from the delivery of mini grids. Dr. Chesson suggests linking agriculture to electricity input to improve energy access in remote areas. How can this be done? Let's find out from her. So the whole point of this is to um, basically critically look at um, what's working and what's not. Um, as I said earlier. There are things that this regime, this mini grid regime has achieved, but it's important to be honest about what it has and maybe can achieve and what it can't, you know, at least not on its own. And this is where, you know, the whole governance um, approach and looking at politics and all of that, uh, mini grid actually should be seen as um, it, from a political economy, from a politics, and also from a development perspective. Okay, so currently we're talking about how um, the Nigerian economy as a whole needs to be kick-started um, to check, you know, all of the rising inflation and the currency um, breakdown and all of that. A key part of what are the sectors that need to be um, revitalized? A key one is agriculture. Where does agriculture reside? It's in the rural areas. Is there an opportunity? We think there is. We know there is. We have um, another paper coming out in this regard. Um, to link um, agriculture to 
to electricity inputs so that productivity can be um, increased in the in these rural areas in this sector. Um, and so the sort of cycle of affordability and electricity use can be strengthened. Okay, so we're looking, that's a more like medium to long term um, thing in terms of uh, when the outcomes will be evident. But it does require for the government to start making inputs now. So as I was saying, don't just see it as a technical um, issue. See, l let's look at how we can link it to our national development ob objectives and where public financing needs to come in for agriculture, um, for energy, you know, for all these inputs sort of are coordinated and, you know, um, it's part of an overall strategy, an overall development strategy. I think that's one major way by which we can, um, yeah, make strides and make um, rural areas more viable because we're not um, content with saying, um, you know, poor, poor rural areas cannot afford these things. Um, the next step is, okay, how can they, uh, how can these things be more affordable to them? So yes, um, 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 look, attack it from the supply side, but also demand side as well. There are demand side initiatives that can be, um, you know, um, introduced, such as this whole idea of revitalizing uh, rural economies. Um, so yeah, that would be another part of the equation. Dr. Chesson shared some more recommendations for equitable electricity access. So we talk about harmonizing the regulatory environment. Um, and this essentially talks about, you know, what we're saying, you can't, um, it's, it's difficult to have uh, many grids work within the framework of um, a failed or a failing broader electricity supply industry. Um, so the, ro the roles um, and responsibilities of the different actors, including the discourse, their capacities, um, how, can, how can they be strengthened? Um, to be able to be more um, to be more productive, right? Um, including for rural areas within the you know because there is no there is no um, there is no reason, for example, why discos should not be playing uh, within the mini grids field. But you know one thing hindering them is that you know they, they don't have enough technical capacity. So um, doing that and just to note that um, shortly after this paper was published, um, the Electricity Act um, was. Um, was ratified. The Act of I think it was 2023. Yeah, just last year was ratified, and so that makes provision for um, you know different states. So it's like for that decentralization, okay, it doesn't. It's not specific to mini grids, um, but this has kinds of things. All these different regulatory provisions it needs to be harmonized um, to make sure that um, different actors are playing different complementary roles, not overlapping. And at the end of the day, the needs of everybody, including um, rural areas, are served. And, you know, again, all the other provisions feed into this. Uh, we need to see if it mini grids within the broader framework of rural electrification policy and um, how does it sit within the, 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 the goal. I think it's, it's about beginning with the end in mind. Um, seeing mini grids, understanding that they are a means to an end and not the end in themselves um, is important. Um, and, and the idea of, um, I think the third one we say is to institutionalize mechanisms for transparent governance of the sector. That's really key. That's an institutional thing. Um, recently, uh, and I can say this here, recently we heard about the, um, we heard about the not so salutary rules from, um, you know, the Rural Education Agency um, and leading to just um, not wholesome practices, you know, within the sector. These are things that need to be safeguarded um, and, and basically the money for real efficient needs to be ring-fenced um, because it's a priority. And finally, um, sp still speaking of money, because um, as Ewa said, finance is a key driver. It's not the only thing. In some ways, it may not be the first thing to, to consider. In some ways, you do have to have institutional capacity first. Um, but finance is a huge, huge part of that. And that's all from us at Africa Science Focus today. If you want to find out more, head to the SciDevNet website. That's www.scidev.net. Today's show was produced by Alice Hurst with editing and reporting by Ogichi Ekeanyawu and Titilepe Faderi. I'm Ogichi Ekeanyawu. Until next time, it's goodbye. Africa Science Focus is produced by SciDevNet and distributed in association with your local radio station.